All right. Let's get started. Welcome everybody to tonight's Healthy Yards webinar, Designing and Constructing Your Rain Garden. I'm glad you're here. It's a, if you're living locally in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, it's a good day to be thinking about stormwater runoff and rain gardens and how we can better prepare for climate change. It's pouring rain all day. So I've been thinking a lot about rain and the enthusiasm I have for it to warm up so I can start doing projects in my yard. Very nice to be joined by many of you tonight, uh, so thanks for being here. Uh, just a reminder, tonight's webinar is being recorded, and we'll circulate a, a link to the webinar uh, to all attendees who have registered for tonight um, in the next couple of days. Um, sorry. Um, and I'll be monitoring the Q&A panel the best I can as I give the presentation, and then at the end of the talk, I'll look through the Q&A and answer as many questions as I can, um, prioritizing ones that are relevant to the most people, um, and then I'll stay on as long as I can to answer all the questions. So please pop your questions in as we go in the Q&A, and um, like I said, I'll try to keep an eye on it as we get through the presentation. So my name is Becca Robinson. I'm the Director of Climate Adaptation Programs at Reap Green Solution. We're, we're an environmental charity based in Kitchener that works with people from all over the Waterloo region, uh, Guelph and townships to um, access the tools and resources necessary to live more sustainably. Uh, we have programs that span across climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, so you can check out our website. You can see it on the screen here uh, to look at ways you can make your home more energy efficient, um, how you can pledge action to help our region achieve an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, um, or various programs that we have within the green infrastructure or climate adaptation side. And I'll tell you more about those tonight. So fundamental to the talk tonight is the important role of watersheds in our lives and how we can be better stewards of our land to help protect the functions and beauty that watersheds provide us uh, for our life here in the Grand River watershed. And it's a good time to remember that the Waterloo region and the Grand River watershed are located on the traditional territory of indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples. We recognize the enduring presence of these people who we share this land with today and their contributions to our community. And tonight's webinar will hopefully give you some really practical tools that you can implement on your own property to help us all be better stewards. So tonight's talk is part of our Healthy Yards webinar series, which is part of our Rain Smart Neighborhoods program we have in partnership with the city of Kitchener. So through this program, we support property owners in target areas throughout the city of Kitchener to slow rain, slow rain down and soak it up in their yards, um, as well as making any other landscape improvements that will ultimately support the health of the Grand River watershed in which we live. So in addition to the webinars uh, in this series, there's one more I'll tell you about later, uh, we offer workshops and talks throughout uh, town uh, throughout the year, and we conduct healthy landscape design consultations as well for anyone who's living in a target area who needs a little more help planning and implementing projects in their yard. And I will explain more about that um, at the end of the talk. So we have a lot to discuss tonight, um, a broad overview of the next 55 minutes uh, we'll spend together. Um, I'm first going to go over relatively quickly, the what and why. So what's going on with our climate and why we need to be conscious of rainwater runoff um, in the Waterloo region area. And then a detailed look at where and how you can manage stormwater runoff in your yard to better protect your home, but also to reduce community flood risk for those properties downstream from you and for the plants and animals that live in our local creeks and river. So first, uh, the what and the why. So here you can see um, a generic watershed. So a watershed is the boundary that defines um, all the land that drains into a particular water feature. So here you can see land that drains into a creek and ultimately um, a larger river and lake. And you can see um, as water would fall on this uh, land, there's all kinds of vegetation and topography for which the water to flow, pool, gather, soak into the soil. Um, and plants 
tree, grasses, trees, all, all the while are helping intercept this rain, soak it into the soil, clean it, and slow it down. So here in our area and in many areas across Canada, um, we are converting natural communities of vegetation into developed areas. This is just one example of such a conversion in our region, um, where we're removing the natural vegetation communities, layers of trees, shrubs, ground cover, thick topsoil um, in the forest, like you see on the right, and replacing it with usually compacted soil, lots of impermeable surfaces like roofs and driveways and streets, and then a whole new set of vegetation, oftentimes, um, very small trees, trees that aren't planted in a lot of soil, so never really reach a full mature size, um, and non-native vegetation. And so what we're working on through this webinar and what we are trying to do with the Rain Smart Neighborhoods program is accept neighborhoods like this on the left that uh, have this big potential to make changes on the landscape that can be stitched together across hundreds of properties or dozens of properties to achieve some of the functions you might see um, in the forest on the right or back to that watershed image I showed earlier. If we understand watersheds, we understand the role of forests and wetlands a bit more, we can try to mimic some of those functions in our own residential landscapes in a way that will prepare us for climate change. So here is a little bit of a cross-sectional view of what uh, the path of stormwater looks like in many of our um, residential neighborhoods, including mine. So you can see at the top, rain falls on the ground, flows over driveways and roads into a gutter or curbing gutter system, where it flows into stormwater pipes underwater that are managed by the municipality or the region. It flows through that pipe uninterrupted, high velocity, and comes out of the pipe right into a waterway. It's coming out of that pipe at high speed, um, warm because it's been flowing over usually like black surfaces, roads, um, concrete that holds warmth in it. Um, and it's coming into the creek really quickly and causing erosion and degrading wildlife habitat. As you can see some images along the bottom that would illustrate that path. So in addition to changing our development and re reducing or removing the natural vegetation communities like I showed earlier, we're also facing other changes, which is climate change. Um, so many of you, probably all of you already are familiar with this concept and we're starting, we can see it now. Um, we used to talk about what we would expect to see and now it's talking about like what we are all noticing, which is warmer, wetter winters, um, more intense rain events, more frequent rain events, and then uh, more intense heat days during the summer. And one thing I noticed quite a bit this year and in the past couple of years is this weird um, kind of uh, out of sync warm temperatures in the winter um, that get plants growing and starting to emerge out of sync with the um, animals that rely on them for food and habitat. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out um, over the next few decades uh, as our plants and animals are getting a little bit out of sync timing wise with the warmer, uh, wetter winters we're having. And so some real consequences to this development pattern of removing forests and paving and building buildings and parking lots, as well as climate change are images like this. So these are two images from the city of Kitchener that show the outcome of when we have tons of runoff moving really fast, uninterrupted and gushing out of our stormwater system. And so these are the end of the pipe consequences to some of these patterns. You can imagine this is not a um, healthy place for plants and animals to live. And this is reducing the water quality that ultimately reaches the Grand River from these two creeks. Other consequences of um, these patterns are different types of flooding. So this is fluvial flooding or river flooding, similar to what I just showed in the last image, when all of this water is rushing into a water course. Um, the water course can reach capacity and uh, overflow its banks. So this is flooding that we're all familiar with. It makes sense when a river receives too much water, it overflows. And there's areas in our town that are notorious for flooding um, the Grand River, including the Grand River. Um, and we see that in the news fairly often. But other types of flooding that we're less familiar with is pluvial flooding or surface flooding. And that is when our stormwater system is at capacity. And so there's not any room at the in the pipe for that water to go. 
So fluvial flooding kind of happens at the end of the pipe where it's entering a water course that's reached its capacity and is overflowing its banks. Oops. But pluvial flooding is when that pipe can't accept any water. So the flooding happens upland, often in urbanized areas, downtowns, residential neighborhoods. Um, and so that is a really big problem. And as our infrastructure is aging and our storm events are getting more intense and more frequent, um, the older pipe systems we have are often not equipped to handle that extra volume of water. And so what we need to do as a society um, in this area, at least to adapt to climate change is to break up that pipe system and create opportunities for water to soak into the soil, slow down, uh, release its contaminants um, and filter back into the groundwater table, which is where we draw our, our drinking water. And so what we'll be talking about tonight in more detail are rain gardens, which are a great way to do just that. And as you can see, um, I hope that panelist uh, table hasn't been in my screen the whole time. There, I moved it. If it has, sorry. Um, you can see from this image uh, kind of what we're going for here. The top images off uh, with the red outline uh, along the top edge show the status quo, a typical residential property, rainwater falling on the roof of the home, flowing off uh, down the downspouts, down the driveway into the curb and gutter. You can see in the second to the left, the image on the second to the left, um, that's the pluvial flooding. So when the, st the stormwater system can't receive any additional water, flooding in our streets starts to happen. And then there's also these end of the pipe consequences where water's gushing out and causing a lot of erosion um, within our waterways and degradating the wildlife habitat. The alternative, which is what we're shooting for, is on the bottom. So if all of the homes in a neighborhood like this, and this is a real neighborhood in Kitchener, can make changes, relatively small changes on the landscape to soak up as much water as they can that's flowing off of their roof and driveway, then much less water is entering the stormwater system at the top of the pipe. So we'll have less of that pluvial flooding in our streets and basements. Um, similarly, if all of these homes are absorbing runoff, what's coming out of the end of that pipe is moving much slower. It's cleaner, it's cooler, and it's much more um, habitable at the end of that pipe in the creek uh, for fish and other types of wildlife and plants that would live in that type of uh, ecosystem. And the water that winds up flowing into the Grand River from that creek is a lot cleaner. Um, and uh, wildlife would benefit from that as well in the Grand River. So the premise of this whole Rain Smart Neighborhoods program is that actions across multiple residential properties can aggregate to make big positive changes to reduce community flood risk, improve water quality, increase our drinking water supply, and protect the local wildlife we have in our area. And ultimately that will protect the beautiful Grand River, which defines our community in many ways. So now we'll get into the nitty gritty of rain gardens. So a rain garden is a shallow sunken garden that's built to capture and absorb stormwater runoff. As you can see in this example here, stormwater is coming off of this home out of a, at the end of the downspout, flowing through a rocky inlet and into a recessed basin in this person's front yard. The basin is filled with plants, which help uh, slow water down, help it get absorbed into the soil. Um, it help, they help filter the water as it moves th through the soil. And then any additional water flows out of this rocky outlet at the bottom of the picture. So these are the main components of a rain garden and we'll talk about those in more detail. So here's a cross-sectional version and cartoonish version of the same thing, basically. Uh, you have a home on the left, rainwater is falling on the roof of the home, flowing down the downspout and not the end of it, flowing very slightly downslope from the home through an inlet and then into this recessed basin, which is the main component of the rain garden. The basin has a thick layer of well-draining soil, and we'll talk a lot about that momentarily. It has a mulch layer to help retain some moisture and prevent plants from drying out. And then it has an outlet to the farthest area of the right. So we're gonna talk a lot about sizing rain gardens tonight, how to do that for your particular um, house. But no matter what, we always wanna be prepared for your rain garden to overflow. 
And we don't ever want it to overflow back out the inlet and towards your house or foundation or downspout. We always want to provide an opportunity for the rain garden to reach its capacity and spill away from your home. And so the outlet ensures that that's going to happen. It's lower than the inlet. So you can feel confident that it will overflow, a water will flow out of the outlet and towards a storm drain in the event of a major storm that's outside of the design um, storm for your rain garden. And then the plants, the fav my favorite part at least, and the most fun part to design. Um, and these play a really important role in adding other value to a rain garden um, in addition to the, the value they add for stormwater management. So you can see here in this image, um, there's a quite a few ver uh, different species of plants that are native to Southern Ontario. You can see on the far left, there's a little tiny squiggle of green with a little tiny squiggle of black, and that is grass. So grass has a lot of short blades, a lot of a very small amount of biomass above ground and a really shallow root system below ground. Relative to these native perennials and grasses, you can see on the right, that have a lot of biomass, so plant material above ground, and these really deep, complex root systems. Some of, are 15 feet deep in the ground, so that's amazing. So you can see that the, the value of native plants would have on soaking water into the soil and slowing it way down and helping filter it as it's traveling through the soil. Above ground, these plants help intercept water, so water falls on plants with this much biomass and doesn't even reach the soil. Um, and then also provides a lot of habitat and nectar for native um, pollinators. So really important to get the plants right in your rain garden and to um, enjoy all the benefits that they bring. Um, kind of small side note to stormwater management, um, we have over 200 species at risk in Ontario, including many pollinators and birds that you see here that don't rely on huge swaths of uninterrupted habitat. So there's a few species in that 200 that need really large territories that aren't um, practically going to be uh, able to survive in our region here. But there's several dozen species that could rely on patchy habitat like you might find in a neighborhood if we plant the right plants in that neighborhood. So in addition to stormwater management, um, having native plants in our yards, like I mentioned before, if we have small changes in many yards, it can add up to um, valuable habitat for these types of pollinators and birds. So that's an exciting kind of secondary benefit of a rain garden. So a rain garden that's sized correctly um, and is functioning properly will fill up with water during a rain event like we have now. I've checked on mine earlier when I was out for a walk before the webinar started tonight. Um, and it will drain completely within 24 hours of a rain event. So for me, and like I said, I just checked half an hour ago, um, my soil is so well draining and my rain garden is so well designed that it doesn't fill up at all. It just Come, water's gushing out of my downspout and just sort of disappears into the soil of the rain garden. Um, I never see ponding in it. However, this garden is one from a pre previous property um, that did fill up. So the soil wasn't as well draining, um, but still fair, like good enough to be a functioning rain garden. And it, so it did pool right after a heavy rain. So this is an image of it filled with water right after one of those kind of intense summer rains and when the sun comes out right after. Um, it's really nice to go outside and play. Uh, so the rain garden's full of water, it looks like a little pond, but within probably four hours of this photo, all of that water had soaked into the soil. So it's not a standing water feature. And it's important to keep that in mind because we're not creating a water feature. We're not creating a mosquito breeding habitat. We want the soil to be draining quickly enough that that water is never stagnant and pooling for long enough to harbor that, that kind of uh, insect habitat. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through eight key steps for designing your rain garden. You can see what the steps are here. The first one is assess your space. And I'm going to walk you through each of these steps, showing you them on the same project. So you can see how one project is started from start to finish. It's not the project you see on the right. Uh, the project you see on the right is a rain garden that we um, worked with a homeowner in Kitchener on several years ago now. Um, the garden started out. Um, 
similar to this in a way. It stopped kind of at the end. You can see some of the chunky brown wood chips where the two white signs are. So this person had an existing landscape that was quite nice, but had some flooding issues occurring um, with their downspout. And so we extended that landscape into a peninsula shape in their yard, extended the downspout a little further out from the house and created a channel for all that water to flow through into a basin um, where it's uh, soaked into the ground and now causes uh, less pooling and trouble for this homeowner in their grass. So rain gardens can take a lot of different shapes and forms, and sometimes they can just be an extension of an existing garden like this, or like in the example I showed at the very beginning, it can be a complete kind of front yard makeover where there's no grass remaining and the whole thing is a native plant landscape with the rain garden integrated. So the examples I show will hopefully be helpful, but they're by no means to say it has to look like that. There's lots of options for how it can look. Okay. So assessing your space. So here is an example of a house that was pretty barren at first, um, had some very tidy hedges and a very shorn turf lawn at the front, uh, but not a lot of ecological value and no significant stormwater management happening. So turf grass, I, I didn't mention this specifically before, but can get really thatchy as we most of you would probably have experienced. Um, it can basically become so thick, the thatch, that it's almost as impervious as the sidewalk and driveway you see here. So really, it's if you consider that all impervious, this property would be shedding quite a lot of runoff um, towards the street. <clears throat> so it's very important to do a thorough assessment of your property in your house before determining if you can build a rain garden, and if so, where. So for me, I observed topography and drainage patterns, washout patterns, plant health, downspout locations, um, and things like that all the time. But I recommend walking around your house in good and rainy weather, so kind of like earlier today, to get a full understanding of what's going on with the rain and drainage on your property. So in the dry weather, it's a nice time to imagine things looking different where you'd like to have a, a garden feature. And the rainy weather, it's a really good time to understand where are your problem spots, where's the most runoff coming out of your downspouts, which could give you a good idea of where to start first um, and where water is flowing once it exits your downspout. Um, and so the general criteria you need to be looking for when you're doing your walkabout, um, you want to situate a rain garden about three meters or 10 feet from a building foundation. And that's because we're promoting infiltration, soaking of soils. So you want to give your foundation a little bit of space for that to happen further away from it and to ensure that water is flowing out of the downspout and downslope away from your foundation before it's going into the basin. You do want it to be on a relatively flat area. So between one and 5% slope, which is pretty flat, but like I mentioned, down, down slope slightly from your house and foundation, but not on a steep hill. Because we're infiltrating so much water, doing that on a, like the side of a hill could um, destabilize the hill and cause erosion issues down the line. You want it to be uphill slightly, like in this picture, from an area where you can direct any overflow. So it's nice if you can situate a rain garden on a very gradual slope away from your house where there's um, space above and below the rain garden. Um, so it's not right up against the sidewalk or something. And you want the area to be clear of any underground uh, utilities or tree roots. So as you'll see a little later, a rain garden requires um, some digging to create the basin and to amend the soil. And so it's important to ensure you're not doing that directly under a tree where there's likely critical roots that are important to the health of that tree or um, important utilities that you would be safer not to disturb. And so to figure that out, you can contact Ontario One Call to get information on what utilities are located uh, on your property and where. Generally, this works best if you have an idea of where you want to um, put your rain garden in, so you can be more specific when you ask for locate. So if you're gonna, you're thinking about somewhere in the front yard, you can specify that so you're not getting any information about your side yard or something, for example. Um, but we'd recommend you do, you do that no matter what, all the time when you're doing a digging project. And if you have any trees in your yard, just be aware that the trees spread quite a bit farther than the canopy, but it kind of general rule is not to be digging a rain garden under the canopy of the tree because you can be sure there's critical roots in that area. 
If you're outside of the canopy, you will likely encounter roots. You might curse yourself for trying to dig in that area, um, but it's a little bit safer to do so. And you just need to do it by hand and do it gingerly and dig around roots um, so that you can leave as many of them intact as possible. Trees provide a huge benefit for stormwater management. So we would never advocate um, for a rain garden over trees or to the detriment of trees. Okay, so now we're gonna pick a location. So once you've gathered all the information I um, talked about before, you can start to pick a general idea of where you think a rain garden might work. So for this project, I picked a spot on the corner, front corner of my house. You can see the existing downspout there. It's going down my house, perpendicular um, to the house into the side yard and nothing much is really going on there. In fact, it's not super sloped. So I think the water is just sort of stagnating outside, uh, of, outside of the downspout, pretty close to my foundation. And there was some evidence in the basement of um, soggy walls and previous water damage uh, when we moved in. So I had kind of was had a heightened awareness of this downspout and what's going on there. So I thought this would be a good thing to address and to change sooner. So here you can see from the aerial view, uh, the general location of where I'd like to put my rain garden. So now that we figured that out, we need to determine the surface area of the rain garden and start to lay out the general shape of it. So how big does it need to be and what shape do I want it to have? So now's a good time to start thinking about your garden in a plan view, which is kind of, which means from above and consider sketching it out on a piece of graph paper. If you can start to scale it um, on a piece of graph paper, that would be helpful. And so to start, um, you need to plan for your rain garden to be about the 10th the size of the area draining to it and 80 centimeters deep. So I'll say that again, kind of slower. The, the, your rain garden needs to be one tenth the size of the area draining to it. And the area draining to it is the roof area that's coming out of the downspout that you're putting your rain garden by. So I'll walk you through that a little here more slowly. So for my example here, uh, my house is 11 meters by 10 and a half meters, basically. So that's the total area of my roof. However, that total area is divided by four downspouts, one at each corner of my house. So you can see at the bottom here, I've done some light math, ca calculating the air total area of the roof and dividing it by four because I have four downspouts and generally the house is pretty symmetrical and draining equally out of each of those four downspouts. So I've now determined the drainage area, the area of roof that's draining out of that one downspout. And that's 29.13 square meters. So I just need to divide that by 10 because I need the rain garden to be about the 10th of that size. So my rain garden needs to be uh, about three square meters of surface area. And so now is where you can get a little more artistic. Um, I like to play around with designing gardens with a hose and random stuff from the garage, but a hose in particular that's detached, of course, holds a curve really nicely. It's heavy enough to lay on the yard for a few hours, a few days while you're thinking about what you want it to look like. Um, and it allows you an opportunity to see it from different parts of the house. So I'd maybe stand out by the street to see if that shape looked good. And then I'd stand up in my bedroom window upstairs, look down and see if it looked good from that perspective. So it's good to use something like a hose that can stay put and you can consider your garden from all angles. So this is me laying it out. Uh, the hose represents the three square meters. Obviously the math is a bit fuzzy because this is like a lima bean and I'm talking about square meters, but I think generally it's, uh, I would like round up. So my garden's a little bigger than three square meters, but I can measure uh, the squares within that lima bean shape to ensure it's at least that big. I've marked the inlet with this uh, blue shovel and the outlet with a hockey stick. So random stuff from the garage. Um, pool noodles represent where I'm going to build up the earth. So I'll show you how to, how to notch in an inlet and an outlet, but you can also influence where water flows in and out of your rain garden by building up the earth around the basin as well, creating little berms. And I'll show you that 
in more detail shortly. So from above, you can see how my rain garden's um, turning out here. I've measured three meters from my foundation. I've drawn this little red line to make sure there's no rain garden that's going over that line, getting any closer uh, to the foundation. I rounded up to four square meters for my garden because I wanted to dig a little less and make it a little bigger at the surface. So you can play around with the math like I sh showed in the or original sizing slide. It needs to be about a tenth the size of the area draining to it, assuming you're going to dig it to be about 80 centimeters deep when you're amending the soil. If you want to dig shallower, you can make it larger at the surface as long as the total volume of rain garden is the same. So if you're comfortable with math, you can have fun playing around with that if you have the space. So I made my garden a little bit bigger and I can dig a little shallower. Now, however, I didn't want my garden to be just a random basin out in the middle of the yard. So the light green line on the outside is how I'm going to extend the whole landscape bed so that my rain garden is a portion of a larger garden project. And I did that on the other side of the sidewalk as well, where I wanted to expand the foundational plantings of these conifer hedges here and offset that by about three meters. And I can, and then I planted a lot of pollinator plants in that area to the right of the sidewalk. And now the new rain garden bed um, kind of mimics that shape and includes a rain garden. Let's see. So I can just talk through this. This uh, audio is not important here. So now you can see what I'm doing where I have my edge of the hose. That was my outside green line. My extension cord is the rain garden basin there. And I'm using my edger to trace along the line of my hose um, to start cutting in the rain garden. So I've decided I like the shape good enough. You can see all my random tools, jump rope, an extension cord, and a hose, and a squirt gun. <laughs> Um, this is all you need to design a rain garden. Uh, so I'm cutting in with an edger. It's a manual edger. It's really sharp and it works really well to cut off sod. And I'm just chucking the sod into, into the inside of the bed because what I like to do is chop it up really good and turn it into the soil because it's kind of like ready-made compost, which will help uh, enrich the soil uh, for your plants. So this is the final product of this state, step. So I edged in the garden, like you could see in the video. I've tossed in most of the chunks um, into the garden and chopped them up. And I use a sod remover to remove any additional grass. But I usually just remove the sod, scrape it off the top and flip it over so the grass side down, so the grass will die and then turn into nutrients for the soil. And so this is what it looks like uh, shaped into the yard and with the sod removed. Okay, so now I need to start worrying about my inlet. So there's a few different ways you can get water from a downspout into a garden. For my project here, I don't have any pathways or hardscaping patios or anything in the way. So my, my inlet's gonna be the simplest way, which is just sculpting the earth um, within this landscaped area so that rain exits the downspout and flows into the basin that I've dug here. If you have a situation where you have a deck in the way or you want to have a walkway or you have a existing walkway, there's a few ways you can do it. So on the left, you see um, this is a new walkway going in. So it's always a good opportunity to think about stormwater runoff when you're doing any project because you wanna have it figured out before you install the walkway or whatever you're excited about uh, because it's very difficult to deal with water after that. There's lots of projects I've been to where Someone has a beautiful patio that they were very excited about, but they didn't think about water until it was done. And, and it's really hard to get water flowing around it or under it um, when it's already installed. So here you can see we left a notch in the patio on the top, um, very top of this walkway on the left. That water's flowing out of this downspout and into a catch basin where it then flows out of a PVC pipe, which is under the sidewalk and into a rain garden that was then constructed. This is a similar situation where water is falling down a downspout on the house. 
there's a deck on the house, which is very common. So it, we installed a catch basin here as well, where water exits the downspout, enters the catch basin, and then flows through a pipe slope down under the whole length of the deck. And there's a rain garden on the other side of the deck out in the lawn. And then this example on the right is sort of similar to what I've got. Well, I will show you on my rain garden, um, just using patio stones to make a feature, a sculptural feature, and to really control the water, but it's flowing over land. So I sleep better at night when water is flowing over land and you're using topography on top of the ground to help guide your water away. The pipes work well. Uh, this middle one's at my former house, so it never had a problem, but it always there's always a potential risk when you're putting water in an enclosed um, space like a pipe. So when possible, I'd recommend keeping it over land. And when impossible, there are some really good pipe options. We recommend smooth walled PVC pipes like you see on the left, as opposed to the corrugated black pipes, which you see used all the time. But you can, the plastic on those is much uh, weaker in my experience, and they can get crushed quite easily and, and get holes in them as well. So I think if you're going to put water into a, a pipe system, a PVC, smooth wall PVC is the way to go. And there's lots of fittings and accessories you can get for that at the um, hardware store. So it's a pretty well established practice. Um, here's another example of a uh, pipe. So this one is using the corrugated pipe. This is not uh, one of my projects, but like I said, you see them used all the time. You can see on the right, however, they did use a smooth wall PVC pipe to capture the overflow from a rain barrel. So you want to think about water flowing from the downspout, but also remember if you have a rain barrel or you want to have a rain barrel, you can include that in your system so that water flows into your rain barrel and the rain barrel overflows into the rain garden. And then you're kind of doubling your impact. You're capturing water in the rain barrel and then a rain garden. And this is the project on the right that the finished project um, of this construction photo on the left. Uh, so you can see when you do use the pipe system, you can't see it at all um, when the plants get established and this person has a walkway around the deck. So it's a really useful strategy if you want to have a pathway around the house and not be stepping over pipes or channels of water. A couple of other examples of inlets and pipes you can see here. This is all one project. So you can see this person extended their downspout in a pipe into a very big rain garden pit. Um, she did the full 80 centimeter dig. Uh, you can see there's a, quite a few tree roots in the basin. So this is what I was mentioning before. If you do encounter tree roots when you're digging your rain garden, it's good to leave them in place and dig around them to the degree that you can. Because after you're done with the dig, you're filling it mostly back in with soil. So the tree roots will be okay ultimately. Um, the digging out is just to remove poorly draining soil so you can replace it with well-draining soil. And this person backfilled her um, channel and pipe area with rocks. So there's almost always a question about why the rocks? Do we have to use rocks? And the answer is no. Many people just seem to like using rocks. So in this case in particular, this, the rocks are purely for aesthetic for, uh, preferences. All right, so you can see my inlet now on my project. So I've got the rain garden, I've got the outside of the bed figured out and now I have my inlet. So I'm gonna have to turn my downspout 90 degrees. So it's pointing forward and extend it by an extra length of downspout from the um, home improvement store and extend it out a little further. So it comes out of the hedge far enough away from the house where the land is sloped down towards my rain garden basin. And so I did the extent, uh, add a rain barrel option here. So you can see the downspout in this configuration goes down the house the way it did originally into a downspout. And then the overflow of my rain barrel is extended through the hedge um, into the rain garden. So you can see there it's raining coming out into the overflow, which is a black PVC pipe that I stuck through my hedge very gently. And it sticks out and flows into my inlet and then into my rain garden. And these plants are all babies, so you can see it really well, but now four years later, you can't see that black pipe 
hard. Like there's a couple weeks at, at the beginning when I haven't installed and the plants aren't fully growing yet, but for the majority of the summer and fall, you can't see that uh, pipe sticking out of my hedge because the plants have um, grown around it. I'm sorry, I'm going to play that again by accident. There we go. Okay, so now that we have the inlet figured out, we have to talk about the outlet. So basically, almost always, an outlet is just a low point along the outside edge of your rain garden. It's lower than the rest of it, lower than all the berms around the rain garden, and lower than the inlet, but higher than the basin. So you can see in these two examples, rocks were used, not for any particular reason other than it highlighted the same rocks that were used in the inlet and these particular homeowners liked that look. It's kind of like dry creek bed look. Um, so you don't have to do that, especially in the outlet because it's used very infrequently. And if water's gushing out of your outlet, then there's probably other problems in your neighborhood because there would have been an extremely heavy storm. So very unlikely for that to happen. I've never seen any water exit either of the two rain gardens I've had at my properties and I've never worked with a homeowner who ever had water flowing out of the outlet either when it's sized correctly. So you can see here this rain garden is in construction obviously and so as we're digging the basin that I mentioned um, before digging up that uh, roughly 80 centimeters of depth we're removing the soil from the basin and putting it in these red areas around the rain garden. So the low point of the outlet didn't exist until we created the berms and the red spots to create that low point of the outlet, if that makes sense. So you're sort of building up the land around the basin, except for in the outlet location. You're leaving that the natural height that it already started, existing grade, so that water can flow out of the basin and out of the outlet. And then you can see after that was completed, we filled the rain garden back up. So all that digging work for nothing except for well-draining soil. We filled in the rain garden with a mix of sand and compost. And we recommend 60% sand and 40% compost to go back into the rain garden basin to make a really well-draining soil. And you can see in this shot as well that we put landscape fabric above any soil we had placed and below the rocks just to prevent weeds from going in there for as long as we possibly could. So I'm just going to look at a question that came in here. Are there configurations on property where it would be impossible to make a rain garden? Or are there usually possible solutions for complex landscaping? There's often a solution, and that's one of the fun parts of um, consulting and helping people figure this out. There's very often a solution. There isn't if there's underground utilities in the way that are too shallow. Um Sometimes the solution involves rerouting your downspouts on your house. So that becomes kind of like out of a landscape designer scope and more of a building envelope scope where you need to rejig your downspouts to get the water to go in the right spot for your yard. Um, the times when it's really impossible is if the slope is too steep and the property lines are too close to the slope and there's not space at the bottom uh, or the top for the rain garden. So those are the most common times when it's just not feasible. Um, and do rain gardens have to be in the front yard only? No, not at all. These are because that's usually where we're working as a like nonprofit helping homeowners, but very often they're in the backyard. Um, one of the examples I was showing earlier with the little boy in the filled up rain garden was in the backyard, the deck example. Um, so they need to be where you have a lot of volume of runoff coming out of a downspout. It can be front, side, or back. There's fewer utilities in the backyard often, so that's sometimes a better spot with fewer um, potential problems. So that's the advantage of the backyard. Good questions. Okay, so back to my project view here, my plan view of my project. You can see now I have an outlet penciled in as well. <clears throat> And so this is what the outlet of this project, my rain garden turned out to be. It's a little closer or further to the left than I originally planned, but not for any particular reason. It just looked better that way as I was building it. So be open to changing your plans a little bit as you go. 
And I use rocks as well at the bottom, just in the outlet to match the inlet. And I used a few rocks in the inlet, not these huge, big swaths of river rock because um, I wanted plants to be the main showcase. Uh, but the rocks are really helpful at first because water does come gushing out of the downspout. And if I didn't have the rocks gathered at the bottom of the downspout there, it would wash out the mulch and the soil and the little baby plants I have planted there. So they're really important at the very, at the beginning, at the least, even if you don't like the way they look, I'd recommend using a few um, so that you can get your plants established. And once they're there and their roots are um, complex and holding the soil together, you can get rid of the rocks or they might not bother you by that point. Good question here. Where can I get an aerial picture of my property? My um, husband's a geographer who specializes in aerial imagery. So I'm a little lucky on that front with getting an aerial <laughs> for this workshop. But you could do something really similar with Google Earth uh, images, I imagine. It might not be quite as clear. Um, or if you know someone with a drone, you can tap them on the shoulder. All right. So plan for soil amendments. That's our next step. Um, I've already basically talked about this, but I'll talk about it again. Um, in order to plan for your soil amend amendments, you need to understand what kind of soil you have in like the native soil. So figuring out if it's sand, loam, or clay. If you're familiar with soil types, you can do a ribbon test, which you can see at the top there. And it's like kind of mixing up your soil with water. So it's sticky. You can form a ball with it. And then you press it between your index finger and your thumb to see if it will form a ribbon. If it can't form a ribbon at all, it just falls right apart. It's probably sandy. If it can form a ribbon that's like an inch or so before it crumbles and falls, it's probably loam. If it can go for like two or three inches, you can make a full on pot out of it. <laughs> then you have clay and that's beautiful for some reason, but not for a rain garden. Clay is not well draining. So if you have clay, that's okay. But you need to know that ahead of time because you need to do a little more work to make your rain garden soil drain well. Um, the other way you can figure out your soil type um, is doing an infiltration test, which you can see at the bottom here. <clears throat> and so I've made a video of me doing it, uh, doing an infiltration test and the link is here, but I'll also send the link out um, in the follow-up email after this webinar uh, where you can watch it. It's like two minutes long, but for an infiltration test, you basically dig a hole in the spot where you want to put your rain garden. You fill it with water, you let the water soak in. And now you have saturated soil. And you fill it with water again. You measure the height of the water in the hole. You go inside for an hour, go do something else and measure the height of it after an hour. And then you get the distance it, it reduced in height, the amount that drained in. So let's say it's 10 centimeters uh, over an hour. And so now you have a rate. Um, and so if it's a certain rate, uh, which is in the video, I think it's five centimeters of drainage an hour, then you have well-draining soil and you can feel good about doing uh, building your rain garden in this location. If it's draining less than five centimeters an hour, then you need to do some soil amendments um, in the location so that you can make sure that the soil is well-draining and you're not creating a pond. And so like I mentioned before, the type of soil amendments you would want to be adding our sand and compost. So if you have poorly draining soil, you're going to want to dig a deep 80 centimeter rain garden basin. So get that clay out, put it somewhere else in your yard or make beautiful berms around your rain garden with it. Then you're going to purchase sand and compost, mix it together in not quite 50, 50, 60, 40, eyeballing it's fine or like it uh, six bags of sand, four bags of compost, for example, um, mix it together in a wheelbarrow and then put it in your rain garden so that about 60 centimeters depth. So you're going to dig down to 80, fill it back in with 60 centimeters of well-draining soil, and you're leaving 20 centimeters at the top for a layer of mulch and then 10 centimeters of open basin where water can really soak and um, stand during a heavy rain. So pool, I mean. And so for mine, because I had really, really well-draining soil, i.e. sand basically in my front yard, I dug the shape of my basin. I loosened up as much of the sand as I could working around the tree roots. I dumped in compost and I stirred it all together. So 
I had the sand already. I owned that naturally. And then I bought the compost to mix in with it. And you can see here, I'm decompacting it, which is really important and mixing in the compost, which is what the plants need to grow. So the compost is really for the plants. If we didn't want plants, we would just make sand pits everywhere. And that would be great for stormwater management, but not for anything else. And then planting designs, the last part. Um, I'll walk through a couple of the fundamentals um, of plants and I'll do it kind of quickly because we're almost at eight o'clock, got 10 more minutes. So for any planting design, rain gardens included, you wanna know your soil conditions, your light conditions, i.e. how much sun or shade does the area have? And what will the mature size be of the plants that you're thinking about or what do you want them to be? And so for a rain garden, uh, we've talked about how the rain garden will have standing water during a rain event. So total inundated soil, completely saturated. But then between rain events, it drains really quickly. It's really sandy. So it's like a drought conditions. So the plants you can put in a rain garden need to be able to withstand inundation and drought. And those are like the two extremes. Um, and so there's a relatively narrow list of plants uh, that like to, to live in a rain garden. It's not that narrow that you can see just one, one of five pages of plants that do like living in a rain garden that live in uh, Southern Ontario. Um, but you need to make sure you're pulling plants from a rain garden plant list, uh, such as this. Um, so you're not wasting money on plants that aren't going to survive in your rain garden. And so this is the page of our rain garden plant list that we have at REAP. It's on our website and I'll include it in the follow-up email at the end of the webinar. There's many flowering perennials and grasses like I showed on the previous page, but there's also a lot of beautiful native shrubs that like living in a rain garden. Ones you'd probably recognize from living in moist, sort of living in moist soils if you like hike around uh, town. Buttonbush um, is a common plant you see in um, swampy areas. Uh, red osier dogwood is the common one you can see in many native naturalized areas and it can tolerate total inundation but it is very happy to be in a drought condition as well so these are also great to consider if you have the space for a native shrub mind you some of these get huge so in my project and i'll show you it in a minute what it looked like um i used dwarf red osier dogwood so not pure native a little less beneficial um, to native wildlife probably, but still somewhat beneficial and more practical for an urban residential landscape. So keep in mind the size that these, um, these guys get, and you can look around for what I call a native R. So a slightly, um, horticultural, uh, version of a native plant that's a little smaller. And so you can see the foundational plants I added to my rain garden were three dwarf red osier dogwoods. I wanted some bright red sticks to contrast with my uh, conifer hedge that you can see. Uh, so I added those kind of on the edge. So on this plant list, you can see an S and a B. B stands for base. And so this is the plant that would like to be in the bottom of your rain garden. that gets the most water where water is standing the longest. Uh, S is for side sl slope. And so that's a plant that can deal with some um, inundation, but not quite as much as the B plants and would like to be on the side slopes of your rain garden. So you can see here, I've put those three red as your dogwoods kind of on the side. They like to be in the base as well, but I uh, wanted them to be kind of like the background of my rain garden. Um, other things you want to keep in mind kind of secondarily to uh, the first criteria I mentioned are seasonal interest, texture, bloom color, and leaf color. So, so this is where you kind of get to the artistry of planting design. And this is a good example of a yellow twig dogwood contrasting with um, a yew, a row of yew shrubs behind it. And I think it's really fun to play around with the color combinations, especially for winter interest. It's kind of easy, not terribly easy, but easier to get an exciting garden for spring, summer, and fall, but it's pretty hard to have an exciting garden in the winter. So thinking about color of twig, evergreen, presence of evergreen needles and things like that are important. And then I always look to nature for uh, combinations that I find inspiring. So you can see here just two shots of a forest floor with 
some spring ephemerals. Um, and the reason I want to show this is you can see it's the contrast, the big broad leaf of the may apple or the trillium contrasting with the like fine textured flowers of ferns or wood aster um, is what makes those both of those really beautiful together. So playing around with contrast. So you want to have a plant with a big broad leaf next to a plant with a like fine textured leaf. And that's what makes a garden interesting. If they're all fine textured, you don't really appreciate them. Same with if they're all hostas or something, you kind of lose interest after a while. But if you can alternate the texture, that's what makes for a really interesting garden. And so some more examples in nature on the left. Um, this is a reminder of thinking about plants that bloom during all times of year. And you can look to our uh, native asters and goldenrods for that example. Like that's the most beautiful combination. Nature does that on its own. And these plants bloom really late into October. Um, and so providing a source of nectar for pollinators who are active in that late in the fall, often which are migrating at that time of year is really important. So keep in mind um, some of these plants and you can extend the value of your garden into the fall when the wildlife need it the most. And on the right is an example of a mature rain garden. I showed it less mature earlier in the presentation, but now you can see this contrast between um, the dogwoods and the ostrich ferns. It's quite nice and it allows you to appreciate them each for what they are rather than having it all blend together. And then this rain garden was built around an existing lilac. So the lilac's outside of the rain garden, but right beside it. So you can uh, integrate a rain garden into an existing landscape. You just have to be mindful of the roots. And then I've mentioned a lot of value of native plants and mostly what grows in a rain garden would be a native plant. That's what all, all the plants on our plant list are native, but there's lots of opportunity to integrate fan, uh, favorites of yours. So I like to share this. It's an example of a homeowner who had a passion for daylilies and didn't know a lot about native plants, um, but we worked with them to incorporate native um, butterfly weed and little blue stem. And now this daylily border is like teeming with insects that it weren't there before. So um, I'm not a complete purist on natives. I think there's an opportunity to mix natives with non-natives as long as your non-native uh, favorites are not invasive. And so you can have a rain garden that's got a really ornamental, tidy appearance if you really want to. And you can have one that's a wild kind of meadow look too. You can really go any direction with the planting design. And so for mine, I love purples and pink, pinks together. Um, so I put uh, Joe Pie weed at the top, blue flag iris and uh, Leatris, the blazing star in my rain garden. And I group them together in clumps Pollinators can see plants if they're in um, a meter wide clump is kind of the target. So rather than mixing them all together, I try to make big blocks of one species. And that also helps you appreciate the differences in texture, like I mentioned before. And then all around the rain garden, I just uh, got to have a little more fun because there's fewer constraints there. I mixed um, wood fern, little blue stem grasses, um, butterfly weed, New England aster, bee balm and this lady ladies mantle is a non-native but i like it so i kept it in my garden and this is what it looks like it looks like a couple of years ago right after it was planted um you can see the plants are still quite small they got bigger fast so you want to keep in mind what the mature size of your plants will be so when you're planting your garden you have uh appropriately space them and you don't have like 10 foot tall cup plant or something in your garden when you didn't really want that. So keep a good look on what the mature size of your plant is before you plant it. A different perspective just to show what the other side of the sidewalk wound up looking like. So you consider your rain garden a really important stormwater management tool, but also a really great opportunity to make a big change on your landscape. So mine ended up kind of changing the whole front yard, both sides of the sidewalk. And if you can think of a rain garden as just a one piece to a larger um, landscape project, it will be probably wind up being more attractive, be more integrated to your uh, front land, front or back landscape, um, and not be like a standalone feature that doesn't quite fit in. 
this is just an example of the Joe pie weed after like a few months in the ground. So my point about that, they do grow quickly and you do want to plan for their mature size. So you don't have any un unpleasant surprises when they uh, establish and get growing. <clears throat> and before you build your rain garden, the last step here is to plan for maintenance. So you want to be able to take care of your rain garden. It will be drought tolerant once the plants are established, but no plants are drought tolerant when they're babies. So you need to make a plan to water your rain garden um, at least a couple of times a week during the first two summers after you build it. Um, obviously some summers we get rain, you know, like I think last summer, we got a fair amount of rain during the summer, but a really hot end of spring, May and June. So just need to be in town or work with a neighbor to make sure you can water your plants um, over those hot months in the first two years of it in the ground. Um, spreading wood chips over the soil is helpful. I recommend a shredded wood chip that won't float away there in the rain. So I like to use a shredded composted pine. You can see here on the right, and it's got a lot of organic material, which, um, releases nutrients into the soil and helps your plants get going. And so in conclusion, um, we have a couple of things we can help with in terms of getting a rain garden in the ground. Uh, we have our Blooming Box native plant sale live right now. You can see the species on this slide here. So we sell these boxes every spring. Um, they're available to, for sale now on our website. The pickup day for them is May 25th. Um, you come to the Reap House or the Cambridge Farmers Market and pick up your box of 15 native plants. We sell a kit for rain gardens, which is the top row here. And that will just take it out some of the, the work in thinking of what plants you want to put in your rain garden. So if you're inspired by tonight and you have a plan for a rain garden, you can get one or two rain garden kits and then you have your plants ready to go. Uh, they're designed to have alternating bloom times and complementary colors to kind of take out some of the guesswork on that part. Um, and Cambridge, Kitchener and Waterloo offer a 50% off rebate for rain garden kits to help incentivize uh, homeowners for to plant build and plant rain gardens. So the sun and shade kits are $90 and the rain kits are 45 when you get the rebate from the city. So pretty good deal. And a good reminder that municipalities want homeowners to manage rainwater so that we can reduce our flood risk in the community in tandem with work that they're doing on the stormwater system and then parks and creeks throughout the city. And this is the second of our third uh, Healthy Yards webinar series. So we have our last one in a week and that's gardening in the right of way. So if a rain garden isn't feasible for you or you're just feeling super keen, you can join us next Wednesday to learn about gardening in the boulevard. Um, there's a lot of considerations to know about, but some beautiful opportunities to uh, make your yard more attractive and valuable to wildlife in the boulevard or right of way of your property. Um, and the last thing I'll say, I believe, uh, is just a reminder about the Rain Smart Neighborhoods program. So you can see here the map of the city of Kitchener where we offer healthy yard consultations. So if you think a rain garden's for you, you think you meet the, the criteria I've outlined tonight and you live in these blue shaded areas, which is quite a bit of Kitchener, you can contact us at the website here and uh, request a consultation on your property with a landscape designer who can come help you really get the details of your rain garden right um, help you with planting plans and all of that. So it's a really nice add on, um, after you've attended a webinar and done some thinking about a rain garden, it'd be a nice benefit. The dots here, are all the homeowners homes and properties we visited over the last three years through this project. Um, and here are some of the projects people have built in partnership with us. Um, you can see several rain gardens. We also offer the backyard tree planting program. And so that is a subsidized tree planting program that operates in Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, and Guelph. It comes with an arborist consultation. So an arborist will come to your property, talk with you about where is the right place to plant a tree and what is the right tree to plant. So you get a tree that will be healthy in your specific conditions and have the best chance of growing to full maturity. And then we come back um, after the consultation and plant the tree for you. It's a fully full service tree planting and subsidized by the municipalities in an effort to grow our urban tree canopy in the Waterloo region. 
And sorry for being five minutes over, but that's it for tonight. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I hope this was helpful for you and I hope you're inspired to build a ring garden this spring or summer or fall. So there's a couple more questions I'll see, read here and try to answer. Um, but if you're leaving now, thanks for coming. We'll see you soon. Okay, so we have we have a steep slope in our yard with a natural swale that drains into a storm drain on our neighbor's side of the fence. In such a situation, would a pond be ideal to avoid exiting to storm drain? Um, well, it sounds like if you have a natural swale and water is draining into it currently, you kind of have an opportunity for a bio swale, which is just a linear rain garden. So I would take a lot of the principles you've learned tonight and consider um, kind of amplifying your swale. You can change the soil in it a bit. So you want to keep it in the same shape of a, the swale naturally is, but you can amend the soil to be well draining. You can make the swale have like a bump out. So it's narrow, the width it currently is, but maybe uh, expand out into a wider basin shape before it narrows back out. So you could create like a stopover rain garden on the path of the existing swale and add plants. So swales are really good at keeping water moving in the direction that they're designed to do so. Um, but adding better soil mulch and plants would add a lot of value to the swale in terms of slowing water down, soaking it up and adding wildlife value. Can the downspout run over land beyond three meters to avoid trees or structures? Sure. If you don't think it will be a tripping hazard um, to go that long out, it, absolutely it can. I would recommend getting these little stakes. You can get the garden center stake goes in the ground, but it's got like a little U. I can't my, try to make it with my hand and the downspout would sit in it because it's a long span and you wouldn't want it to like blow in the wind or somebody trip on it and it like gets torn off. So you'd want to um, put some stakes down to keep it in place. So, you know, it's draining towards a ring garden, but consider if you could sculpt something into the earth so that it's not that long. If you can extend it far from the house, the, the downspout doesn't have to be three meters from the house, but the rain garden should be. So the downspout can still be shorter as long as it's emptying into like a channel in the ground that's directing towards the, the rain garden. So I'd consider that if possible. But in cases where there's trees, I've definitely done some long downspouts supported by stakes. It often looks nice too, because the tree's like blocking it. So you can't really see it. Does piling snow on the rain garden harm the plants? Good question. Not if they're perennials. Um, it's a great place to pile snow. Um, like right now, the plant, the snow would be gone, but the plants would be just perking up. So the plants would be fine. If they're shrubs, like woody plants, you would likely damage them. So if you're planning to pile snow in or around your rain garden, I would consider avoiding woody species that will break because they don't grow back, you know, quickly every year, like a perennial would. I would just stick with herbaceous perennials like grasses and flowers um, if you're doing that. <clears throat> Confirm, yes, tree consultations are available in Cambridge, but not the rain garden visit program, but you can definitely build a rain garden in Cambridge. We'd recommend it, but we don't offer consultations on your property currently. And do we have partner organizations in Waterloo, Cambridge, Blair? We work with lots of organizations um, in those areas. Um, in terms of like partner, like do they do the same thing as us? I can, no, not really. There's no one doing like home consultations that I'm aware of. That's a nonprofit working in partnership with municipalities. Um, yeah, so that's my answer there. We are have been successful at spreading the tree program to a lot many of the municipalities um, in the area, and we're. We have a rain garden program in Guelph and in Kitchener that we're always working to expand that as well. We can do more site visits. The webinar is very helpful, but that site visit really helps people take it to the finish line. Um, in absence of that, I hope the webinar has been helpful for people considering a rain garden. All right. Those are all the questions I think that have come through. So like I said, we'll send an email out in a couple of days with a video recording link and some of the links to resources I've mentioned throughout the webinar. So feel free to let us know if you have any additional questions after that.
And thanks again uh, for joining us tonight. I hope everybody has a great night.